called uh, Decentralized Control for Urban Zoom Networks. And the speaker is Neil Wong. So th thank you very much to the organizers for having me. I'm going to try and quickly recover from that last video. Um, so <laughs> um, I, I changed the title of the talk a little bit. So I, I kind of had a look at what other people were talking about in the meeting. And I had a bit of a think about, you know, what, you know, societal networks probably isn't quite a thing yet. So I had to think about different projects that I've been involved with that have some notion of societal networks associated with them. So it's a bit of a kind of smorgasbord of different projects and topics, some of which is very old and unpublished, some of which is kind of ongoing projects. Um, there's a list of uh, collaborators here. Uh, uh, so Lachlan, Andrew, Hai Vu, and Tung Lee are all in Monash in Melbourne in Australia. And they were involved with some projects to do with um, simulating traffic lights. Uh, Peter Appleby. Uh, Thomas House and Jack McKenzie were all involved in a project with a company called AutoTrader where Peter's the head data scientist. Uh, some work on queuing uh, with Maury Bramson and Bernardo Doria and some work on auctions with Peter Key and Frank Kelly. Okay. And, and then finally but not least, uh, there's my sort of northmost co-organizers, Richard Connors, Ian Watling and Mike Smith. And we kind of organize this kind of north of England workshop on transport modeling and mathematics with transport modeling. We have sort of two meetings a year, one which is an academic meeting and one meeting that's like a transport consultants meeting where we sort of invite various people and they talk about what sort of simulation models they're using and things like this. Okay. Um, so, so, so like I say, this talk is an overview of various uh, projects and they all involve uh, cars in some way, shape or form, either cars virtually, cars online, or cars exchanging positions physically in the road. Okay, um, and for each of these, there's going to be notions of social network analysis, auctions, and online marketplaces, and also control. Okay, <laughs> and I figured, you know, given the theme of the workshop and the other talks, so these are kind of three themes within the kind of societal networks theme. Okay, right. Um, so uh, the first part I'll talk about, which is like very, very, very old work from when. So I did a a internship at Microsoft Research with Peter Key, and we were meant to be looking at various auction data from Bing, and then the data took a long time to arrive, so I started this initial project looking at the exchange of cars on a uh, Microsoft Xbox platform. Okay, so that's the Microsoft uh, Xbox 360. Um, and for that, they had this computer game called Forza Motorsport number two. Okay, and then on this, um, you can essentially race cars, and then you race the cars and you get money, and you also get cars, which you can then personalize and then sell, okay? So for example, here we're close to Easter, so here's a cream egg car, if you know, I'm not sure if you get Cadbury's cream eggs in America, but okay, anyway. Um, so you can personalize this, it can be very personalized, and then you go online, and you sell them on Auction House, which is an online platform where the, you know, the several hundred thousand users who then go online and trade and sell their cars for game money, okay? All right, so this is just a bunch of descriptive statistics about this auction place to start with, just to kind of set a way of thinking about these things. Okay, so here's a picture over time of the number of auctions that take place per day. It's renormalized on the um, y-axis for kind of, because uh, not allowed to give all the data away. Uh, but you can see here clearly the Japanese release date followed by the US release date and then the European release date. And you can also notice that there are kind of peaks on the weekends because people game more on the weekends than they do during the week. So that all makes sense, okay? And I, I, w one of the most interesting things I found about this, this data set um, was the way the kind of auction structure and the way things changed over time. So. It was an eBay style auction, so you have a reserve price and you also have a buyout price, so you can also decide if you want to set a price that you can guarantee to buy that item for, okay? And what you see here is the average reserve price at the bottom, the average buyout price, which is sort of the thick line that ends up in the middle, and the average sale price, okay? And the, the, one of the things I found most interesting about this is there sort of seems to be sort of three phases to this auction as it gets released. So there's a kind of initial phase where all the cars are sold at the reserve price. 
Then there's almost like a kind of like a phase transition almost, where people suddenly discover they've got enough money, and when they go into the marketplace, they just buy the cars at the buyout price. Okay, so things kind of go from everyone just pays the minimum amount they can. It's kind of a thin auction, okay, with only kind of one buyer per car. Then it goes to a situation where it becomes kind of rich, people get wealthy, there's competition, and then people just go, well, I'll just find the first car I can buy at the buyout price. And then it goes beyond that, where people start to specialize and personalize their cars. And then we get this kind of very heavy oscillatory behavior in the average reserve price, I mean, the average price of the cars, which is this kind of wiggly behavior over here. OK, so the auctions start to move to be close to the buyout and then go to this kind of crazy phase where uh, there's a big fluctuation in the buyout price. And actually, what we find from the data is actually a relatively small number of people entering the auctions causing these big oscillations, okay, which then indicates something that's really going on in this system. Okay. So, so why, why is this happening? Um, well, if you look at the kind of the graph of the trades which are going on in this, you can notice that it's got kind of like a social network type formation. So if you look at the number of uh, the degree of each user in terms of the number of bids that they're making, and take logs on both axes for this distribution, then you see that there's kind of a power law degree distribution going on in this graph, okay? Um, and so that's something very typical of kind of what they'd say complex networks, okay? Though in this auction system, there's no notion of a social network associated with it, so people don't know who else are buying and selling, so there's another source of this power law effect. So when people talk about the rich get richer effect, it actually is a people getting richer in game money and then get, causing themselves to get richer. And you can then plot, for example, the, uh, I think this is the sales distribution, complementary cumulative distribution of the number of sales, and it's approximately kind of a log normal type of distribution uh, for the wealths that people are doing in terms of the, their expenditures, okay? Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Um, and then, um, then you can also look at the connectivity graph and do various kind of graph analysis of the kind of distances and clustering coefficients and things like this. So we did some of that. Um, so this is June the 11th. We just looked at all the people going active on Ju June 11th, about 21,000 people, okay? Um, the majority of which are connected to the giant component of this graph, okay? And it's quite a sparse graph as well, okay? So even just within a single day, you see a kind of complex network type structure arriving of people entering, buying, and selling within this auction, okay? Um, then at this point, all the data arrived on from Bing search, and I kind of spent time looking at that. Um, and, you know, these kind of analysis kind of changed my view about um, the way to look at auctions. So a lot of the kind of auction theory that I'd, I'd kind of read about you know, you have this idea of kind of a fixed static auction with a fixed set of buyers, okay, and then you can do mechanism design on this. Um, but the, actually the reality of these kind of online systems is more very complicated. There's large pools of people that come together and then kind of go away and then don't see each other for a long time and then come back together and don't see each other for a long time. And so that is something that, you know, we felt needed to be taken account for in the way that auctions are designed and the kind of mechanism design questions. And so we, you know, in the, in the kind of, so after these kind of, which is just really exploratory data analysis, after this we kind of began to look into kind of uh, auction mechanisms, okay? So uh, we wrote a paper about this, Peter Key, Frank Kelly, and myself, um, on efficient advert assignments. So given that the interactions on, online of auctions form a complex network, mechanism design should take account for that. So really, when people go online to an online platform like Bing or Google or something like this, they should just see, they'll probably just get like an average click-through rate or number of clicks on their different adverts, which they buy via auction, okay? The sets of people that they compete with over those auctions is constantly changing and is random, okay? And in fact, the sets of types of auctions is so massive that you shouldn't really be assuming that you're working with a single auction type, okay? So we basically looked into kind of a, a way of thinking about these and looking at each auction as an individual component of a large distributed optimization, okay? So we wrote a paper on this, a kind of a, a massively distributed VCG mechanism where 
isolate, let's say, every tau of the sample space of some probability distribution, you do an individual VCG auction, and does that give you an efficient outcome, a utilitarian, socially optimal outcome overall? And you can get that to work out, okay? So, um, so that was one kind of line of work, which was based initially on some exploratory data analysis and then lead to kind of some papers. Um, theoretically, what we were doing in terms of this work to get the mechanism design parts to work out is following this line of work of which Bruce is in the audience and Ramesh Johari was here yesterday. They had this idea of kind of scalar parameterized VCG mechanisms. We kind of do that for a kind of larger distribution. Okay. Um, and also, you know, VCG is something uh, which is a type of auction mechanism. Uh, it's something that's, you know, taken quite seriously. Uh, so there's a paper there by Harris and Halvarian, who's the chief economist at Google, where they look into how they go about implementing these types of VCG mechanisms. And it's certainly something that's in their mind. So I, I went a few years back when I came to California, I went down to Google and met some of the folks who implement this stuff and had a bit of a chat about, you know, VCG there. Okay. All right. So, so, so if, if kind of the analysis of that Forza motorsport was kind of like, you know, bitcoins, if you know what I mean, now it's like, let's think about like real cars. Okay. So, so when I, I, I arrived in, in Manchester, I'm at Manchester University, I've been there for about two years now. Um, I realized there were some projects going on. We'd just been uh, approached by a company called uh, Auto Trader. Okay. And I don't think Autotrader has a very big profile in America, but um, it has quite a big footprint in the UK. And it's something that initially started out as kind of like a paper magazine in the 70s, 80s, okay? And if you wanted to get a new second-hand car, they'd publish this magazine every month, okay, and put all their second-hand cars on it, and then people would go in this way, okay? So if you ask anyone, say, above the age of 40, they just think of it as a paper magazine, okay? Though what's happened is it's sort of grew its online business uh, in the early 2000s, okay, and then slowly moved into actually they don't have a paper magazine anymore, and it's just an online marketplace for secondhand cars, okay, so that's what auto trade looks like today, okay. Um, so it's a, it's a FTSE 250 company, it's got about, worth about 3 billion, uh, 2, 3 billion, and uh, basically they're about 85% of secondhand cars in the UK go onto this website, okay. Um, all right, and so I think in recent times, the last two, three years, I've kind of realized that really the value of their company is one, the amount of coverage they have over the UK car market, particularly secondhand car market, which is a reasonably big, a lot of people buy secondhand cars in the UK, um, is that they, their data is really quite important to them and they've sort of grown a, a smallish data science team, which are now kind of engaging with the University of Manchester because they're based in Manchester. Okay, so this is what happens when you search for a different type of car, you get a list of cars, it's all very, you know, like you're used to with these kinds of online businesses, okay? So I, I was just gonna explain some of the projects we've been doing with them and some of the practicalities around that. Again, it's a little bit descriptive statistics and there's a bit of this kind of Thompson sampling stuff that we heard about yesterday, okay? So quite applied again, okay? So this is the work of editor who was a uh, MSc student with us in Manchester, um, and she worked on various issues around clustering analysis of the, their data in terms of the different types of cars. Okay, she's now a marketing analyst at Nestle. Um, okay, so uh, we basically just looked at how to cluster the different types of cars together. So here's one with um, a method called affinity propagation. Okay, and then a second clustering analysis with uh, something called k-means plus k plus plus means, okay? So that's sort of k-means, but with the kind of warm start, okay? So it gets a slightly better initial configuration. And you can see here, here, it does quite a good job. Um, uh, for example, uh, we notice that the red cluster contains Audis, BMWs, and Mercedes-Benz, and so it's able to kind of, just by looking at the characteristics of the cars, come up with classifications of the kind of car groupings. And that's something that they're kind of quite interested in because Previously, they've done things through sort of psychologist surveys where they kind of um, 
ask a bunch of people, you know, what kind of person are you? Are you a kind of adventurous buyer, or are you kind of, you know, someone who needs a people carrier and things like this? And we kind of want to move away from that to something where they're actually looking at the data and the way people access the website in order to kind of characterize the different kinds of users. So, so uh, Shrikant's talk, for example, on topic modeling has been very relevant to um, some of the things that we're starting to look into as well. So, so kind of EM type algorithms to kind of decide uh, what interest people have uh, is quite useful in terms of recommending. Okay, so w one of the interesting things about looking at their cars also is, is looking temporarily over time, uh, the changes in the number of uh, cars that are discontinued and looking at that through the data. And you can see that actually the EU regulations on cars have a big impact on the types of cars that are being released. Okay, so you see big peaks where a new piece of EU admissions regulation is brought in. Okay, so I can imagine, you know, as things become more electric and renewable, you can see these sorts of impacts coming through. So, you, you know, something you might not initially anticipate, though obviously they are designing these regulations to change the types of cars that are being made, but they are having quite a big impact. Okay, uh, so that's, that was what editor looked into in her thesis last summer. Okay, um, we also, before that, we had another MSc student, Jack McKenzie, who's now doing a PhD with us funded uh, by Auto Trader. Um, so, um, so Jack kind of turned up. We had the idea of doing some stuff on recommendation systems. Um, I, I knew about some of the stuff like uh, TrueSkill, which was kind of Microsoft's click-through prediction ranking mechanism, uh, which is all published work. Um, so we looked into that, and then we kind of continued. And um, so now we're kind of looking into implementing different forms of multi-arm bandits on Autotrader's website. Um, so as aside from some work on kind of queuing systems and multi-arm bandits and regret for queuing systems, I haven't really worked systematically on multi-arm bandits as a research topic. Um, so I've kind of been reading a bit of the literature, not trying to prove regret bounds, so just trying to come up with an algorithm that's going to work on this, this website, OK? Um, so, so, so what happened, so I just explained the story so far with that. It's, not finished yet, so this kind of in progress with, with Jack's PhD. Uh, but essentially, we see uh, a ranking of cars, and the top ranked car there is a featured listing. So these are car these are uh, garages are paying a premium to have their car ranked higher. Okay, um, and Auto Trade would outsource this to a company called Hook Logic. Okay, and then about just as Jack was sort of finishing his MSc. Hook Logic got bought out, um, and then Auto Trader were like, "Ah, what are we going to do?" You know, um, and so we were kind of working on this kind of stuff, and they thought, "Well, we'll just keep this project going." And then we're kind of essentially looking to replace what well Hook Logic have now gone, um, and we're now replacing their way of listing this top advert with a kind of multi arm bandit approach. Okay, so so it's just to explain a little bit of the story so far with that. So current consultancy is bought out. Um, so then we have to deal with like some of the practicalities that some of these websites, you know, they've only recently started to hire data scientists, and a lot of the people are kind of like people from like Dunhumby, so people like who do market analysis for Tesco and things like this on products and things like this, rather than uh, this kind of stuff. Um, so they haven't been recording the people who don't click on adverts; they just call them, record the number of clicks. So that's something that's quite common across different online businesses. Maybe not in California, but in the UK, uh, that's that's an issue. Okay, so we have to get them to work to record their non-clicks. And then we're, we're just going to implement vanilla Thompson sampling. As, um, so that's, that's coming in in a few weeks now. <laughs> Probably next couple of weeks they're going to uh, implement Thompson sampling. And, 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 and like was mentioned yesterday in the talk, it's, if you've got someone who's like been working for like a marketing consultant as a data scientist, they know logistic regression. And, it's, and they also know Bayesian logistic regression. OK, so you can explain that to them. They say, well, you just do this extra Monte Carlo step on it, and then you implement it. So it's a very, so rather than, ex I, you know, rather than getting Sarnoff's theorem and trying to explain K KLU KLUCB and this kind of stuff, although the bounds are better in terms of the practical implementation, explaining it to people is just massively easier. OK, so we'll be implementing the kind of normal Thompson sampling and then looking into uh, the practicalities of doing the next step. So one thing that's mentioned was this. Uh, Yahoo paper, which first looked into Thompson sampling. And, and one of the issues you have there is that um, 
although normal Thompson sampling has a conjugate prior, okay, so meaning that you've got a closed form expression for the normalizing constant. If you're trying to do something that's going to have various covariates associated with it, that's no longer the case. And so we've got to look into the practicalities of the kind of normalizing constants that we're going to use. And so there are various approximation me methods. I mean, you can do straight Monte Carlo, but that's going to be slow. So we've looked into kind of a PLAS approximation, variational Bayes, which looks into kind of a product form structure with the, with the normalizing constant and expectation propagation, okay? And then as we're wanting to kind of introduce more features of the users that are coming in, that's where we're gonna start using, hopefully start to use more topic modeling and things like this to try and extrapolate from the searches that people are making what they're actually interested in, what categories of cars, okay? So there's lots of things to do there. It's been quite fun so far. Um, obviously, this is something that's just gonna get implemented for that top slot, but we want to kind of broaden it out to the rest of the adverts. Um, they currently have a system where they essentially just call up different garages and just say, hey, you know, what do you want this week? This kind of thing. Uh, and I kind of think they should change the mechanism that they use for selling these adverts. Whether we can convince them is a different matter. I mean, they're used to, they're, you know, they've got a system that works for them, so I don't want to change too much. Uh, and the other aspect is revenue management. I mean, they've got very unique data on the prices and how to change those of different cars as well. So. Uh, for some of the bigger car companies, if something's on the forecourt for over, say, six weeks, they'll put it out to auction, and there's a clear revenue maximization problem that they have there in terms of how they drop the prices up until it comes into auction. Okay, so that's something I really want to work with them on, but we've got to kind of do this problem first and then, you know, build up trust and then go from there. Okay, so that's where that uh, project lies. So, so cars virtual cars, cars online, and then now I want to kind of talk a little bit about cars on the road and scheduling those, okay? So again, stochastic environment, resource scheduling, this kind of stuff, okay? Um, so when I was in Amsterdam, we had a PhD student, Peter Kovacs, and his topic was uh, essentially uh, traffic scheduling. And the thought at the time was like, well, there's all this stuff in communications literature, surely that should transfer over quite seamlessly to um, scheduling of junctions in traffic systems, okay? And kind of as this project went on further, and we did, I was kind of doing additional research on the side, kind of came up with a different view of things, but, you know, not... So, so here's the kind of thing we'd be used to in the communications literature. That's an input queued switch, okay? Which would be kind of a core internet router, and there's matching constraints, bipartite matching constraints on this system, in a very similar way to the way you'd have a junction where there's... Uh, constraints on the system due to conflicting traffic movements, which is what Travin was talking about earlier, okay? Okay, and then you connect these things together to make networks, and there's notions of things like ICIP, uh, TCP fairness, max weight, back pressure, proportional fairness, they're all kind of things that are used to in that literature, okay? Um, whereas in the traffic kind of domain, there's obviously different nomenclature, um, this is a simulation software which we work with, Sumo, but there's a lot of different types of simulation softwares. Uh, this is one that's free, publicly available, but also used by traffic engineers. Um, these are the kind of systems we're looking at. So these are from my collaborators in Melbourne. That's uh, the Melbourne CB, which is downtown Melbourne in the, in the center of the city there. Okay, And the kinds of things they look at are like web tags, which is kind of UK government legislation around transport systems, Saturn, which is like a long-term planning software made by the ITS in Leeds, so there's the, the guys in Leeds in the northmost group. And then you have different uh, vehicle actuated control mechanisms. So Scoot and Mover there are made by the Transport Research Laboratory uh, in the UK, which is probably the main leading vehicle actuated software at the moment. And I, I kind of went down to visit them to kind of chat about what they were doing. Uh, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement on what they currently do. Um, and then SCATS is an Australian version from Sydney. And then you've got Utopia, which is probably the next closest rival to the Scoot uh, traffic assignment software. And then Rhodes is a further uh, uh, system. Okay. So I, I kind of wanted to put the word real time in, in the title because then it fits within the topic and the talk. Okay. So why do real time? And I want to do some very basic queuing theory. My main background is not statistics 
or machine learning, but queuing. Okay. Um, so we have a single server that can serve one of two queues, which has an arrival rate. Okay. You can do any schedule on that red line there. So from serving all the top would be serving everything in junction two, and the bottom would be serving everything at the first queue. Okay. So if you have, I think Pravin, when he talked at the planning meeting for this, said that like something like 97% of US junctions are fixed cycle. So why is fixed cycle a bad thing? Well, the stability region of this is a subset of what you can actually achieve. It, let's say you do 50-50, you divide your servers 50-50 between those two junctions, and that's the set of rates that you can stabilize. Okay? Whereas if you did something like longest queue, or m is generalization max weight, then you get the whole region. So that's one t reason why using things that are vehicle actuated or real time based on the current state of the system is a good thing to do. So adaptive, adaptive is better for maximizing throughput. Okay? Here's another reason. Okay? Let's suppose I continue with that longest queue analog and I did some calculations assuming everything's Markovian. I can calculate the, the stationary expected queue size of that. Okay? So there's a row divided by one minus row. Okay? And I can also do it if I did the fixed cycle length. Okay? And what you can realize is that you get half the queue size by being adaptive compared to what you get if you are not adaptive, okay? So in the kind of stochastic networks which two, you'd call that resource pooling, okay? So even if both stabilize the system, longest queue pools the resources together and makes a factor of two improvement in this system, okay? And the same is true for those input queue switches. If we did max weights, Shrikant has you know, these results where you say, that uh, rather fixed um, scheduling of an input queue switch would have like an n squared complexity where n is the number of ports, whereas something like Maxwell would have an n complexity. <coughs> okay, and w I also did some, some, some work on that. Okay, so it seems like we should do something like longest queue or max weight. And this is kind of where, like halfway through doing this project, yeah, one minute, okay. Uh, we realized that actually you can prove that longest queue service isn't maximally stable. Okay, so actually if you serve the longest queue, if you connect these things together to make junctions, then you, you're not gonna have maximum stability, okay? So you can simulate this kind of junction, you end up with this kind of oscillatory behavior. So networks of queues connected together, or input queue switches that do longest queue aren't gonna be the best necessarily, okay? And seeing as I've got one minute, the, the, the main point that I want to make is you should do something that's more kind of fair to each junction, so you should do something proportional to the queue length at the different <coughs> junctions. So if you want to do it um, on a setting like this, which would be unstable on the longest queue, you want to do something that's proportional to the lengths of the numbers of jobs at the different queues. Okay, anyway, I'll stop. That's, that's, that's probably enough. Yeah. Questions, please. <coughs> Last chance for questions. Is there anything on this last uh, question where you have <coughs> different types of vehicles with different service requirements? Uh, not yet. I mean, okay. So mostly here we consider everything kind of without any specific priority. A separate project with a PhD student of mine were looking at how you can maintain maximum throughput whilst having priorities between different junctions. Uh, Shrikant has a nice paper that does this does maximum stability. He doesn't have priorities in that paper, but I think you can adapt his proof to do that. Well, you can adapt his proof to do that. So there is ways of, of, of getting priorities, which is important for pedestrians and things like this in the road traffic situation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.